1.20 that Tuesday morning, my phone rung. It was the Vanderbilt Hospital, the medical hospital in Nashville, and they said that uh, we have a uh, young man up here, that a shot victim that we believe is your son. And I was like, no, I doubt that. You know, everybody was there, you know, my uncles and all that, and the doctors came up to me and they said, uh, Miss Greenlee, you know, we really like to talk for you to talk to Dr. Such and Such. And so she gave me that look. And when she gave me that look, that kind of just, my heart just kind of dropped to my foot. I said, just let me see my son. I pulled the curtains back. He was laying on the little iron table. Um, still had his coat on and blood everywhere. I just laid on top of him. I just laid on top of him and I closed my eyes. I put my hand on his forehead and uh, I just started praying. I saw the release and the peace on his face. He was in such misery, such pain. We were so caught up out here in this cycle of, of misuse, mistrust, injustice, just no one there for you. I was at one hand relieved, and on another hand, I was devastated because as a mother, I, I failed my kid. I, uh, I, I, I couldn't protect him. I, I couldn't raise him. I, I didn't know how to, how to teach him the values of life because I didn't know the values of life. And that right there just started a whole nother journey for me. Um, found out he was gunned down by a gang member. Well, tell me, you know, what did he do? You know, did he rob somebody, rape somebody, break in somebody else? I'm like, no, ma'am. He came down the sidewalk with a blue scarf on, and it was a red scarf territory, which was Crips and blood. I'm like, so you're telling me you killed my only kid for a scarf? And they say, yes, ma'am. You know, because the last thing he said when he went out that door, he said, he said, Mama, if anything happened to me, you have to promise me that you'll take care of my peeps, my folks, you know. And I'm like, what the world? You know, what kind of language is that? You know, to some, some peeps, some folks. And young kids started showing up at my job and found out the kids was gang members. So they started coming. They just kept coming, and I, I didn't understand it. It was like they was either getting out of juvenile, they was getting expelled from school, and coming to me. I'm like, I don't know nothing about you getting expelled from school. How to get you back in there or none of that. They are human. They are young kids that just made a left turn and wasn't nobody standing there to guide them. And, and just knowing even all the trips I made over close to 200 some trips in and out of jail. If anybody just had to been at that iron gate door one time when it opened, other than my drunk uncle and my drunk daddy, maybe something would have triggered in me. Yeah, I, I know for a fact if somebody had been at that other end of that door, I wouldn't have made as many mistakes as I made. If I get some of these young gang members out of gangs and become advocates themselves, community leaders, and show them this justice system, they could go back and fight for the rights of their other fellow men. And then more than anything, to show society that you got one that's not scared of you because I've been through your system, so I, I know how your system sucks. God gives me the health and the strength to wake up every morning and it's like, I be like, what I got to do now? What, what's next, what's next, you know? And I think this is your second chance in life to get it right. That's the way I take it. They never thought I'd be doing this, but I'm taking care of his peeps, his folks. You know, I'm, I'm fighting for them. And of course, my, my my grandson is seven now. I know what to do for him, and that's that's another main reason I won't look back. <laughs>